Okay, guys, welcome to this afternoon's show. We are with Neil Bird, a mortgage broker with Cara Mortgages. He's an expert in his field in terms of getting the right mortgages. Now there's a updates going on, so we're touching base with Neil. Andrea's along to the show today as well to ask a couple of questions. Um, so we're going to find out more about if you know anybody that's looking to arrange a mortgage right now or looking to know about how mortgages work, this is the show to watch tag them in it right now or share them with it right now. Show us some love, hit that love button as well. And if you want to take part and comment on the show and actually ask questions, feel free to do that as well. Anyway, Neil, it's over to you. What is happening in the mortgage market? Now, that's a big wide question, isn't it? <laughs> it's a, well, the short answer to that is chaos. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> because of, obviously, interest rate rises and that kind of thing. Um, and lenders pulling their rates at little or sh little notice or no notice at all. Sometimes you get yeah. notif notified before, three hours before a rate disappears that you've got to get an application in. Um, mm -hmm. So from that point of view, things are very, very tricky. Lenders are still keen to lend, though. So these are, these are obviously the positives. Um, there's been a few changes, well, in... It's like partly in the industry overall, but also uh, one particular for Scotland for first time buyers, which obviously we want to talk about. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's it's a busy old time, just like it is for you. But mm. uh, yeah, it's keeping on keeping us on our toes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, particularly, what, what prompted me to ask you about this question was uh, you. We had primarily found seen something about the lift scheme. Um, now, do we want to go over what the lift scheme is? What, yeah, so you know? the lift scheme stand well, lift L I F T stands for low income first time buyers, and they oh, have okay. two parts to it. There is an open market shared equity scheme and a shared equity scheme for new supply, which is housing associations building low low price properties that the government would then mm -hmm. help out for deposit. The, the changes that you're referring to, though, apply to the open market part of that. And in general terms, yep. it's been around for a good number of years now. Um, it only applies in Scotland. And the Scottish government could contribute between 10 and 40% of the purchase price of a secondhand property for someone who doesn't have much deposit and on low in incomes. There are set price okay. thresholds depending on the number of bedrooms you need and where you're buying. And traditionally, yep. there has been a restriction that you could not pay over the home report valuation for a property under right. any circumstances, but that's one of the changes. So they've now removed that rule because obviously yep. you'll know as well as I do that trying to get a property for valuation or, or under these days is, is not impossible. You've got no chance, eh? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um, it, before, if you had to pay 10, 5, 10 percent over valuation, you, you couldn't use the lift scheme. That restriction mm -hmm. has now been removed, but that additional percentage over valuation has to be paid out the customer's own means on top of their normally 5 percent contribution for the scheme. Yeah. Um, the other slight change is that in some areas, property price thresholds have gone up um, in light. Well, obviously, property price growth over the last couple of years has been, been pretty high. In five, depending on where you're buying, um, it, there's, there's quite a big variation. So, for example, if you're looking at a, a three-bedroom property in North Fife, you'd yep. be looking at a max price of 160 or a max valuation we could now call it 160. And if it's South Fife, so you'd be talking Leave and Methyl, Kokori, Glenrothes, um, and across across to the to the west, you'd be looking at about well, 110. So there's about a okay. 50,000 pound variation between the two. Yeah. And is that something that's just is that new or was that something that's always been in place? Because I, I always thought it was one one size fits all. Originally it was, um, but going back probably three or four years now, they did start to separate North Fife and South Fife. Because obviously you've got St Andrews in the East Nuke, which bears yeah. no resemblance to the rest of the rest of the county. No. So 
they did change that, but North Fife to me still tends to be a bit out of touch with the reality of what property prices would actually be. Well, you know yourself. I mean, a two bedroom in uh, Silver Dykes, for example, in Cellar Dyke is two hundred thousand. Yeah, that's a two bedroom Which, flat. Exactly, and you for that you would need. Well, I mean, the limit on on that would be a four bedroom property, so it just doesn't really fit. But certainly South Fife, um, it's much more realistic, and it's probably and it's within the sort of the budget of people on low incomes that it's aimed at anyway mm -hmm. so if anybody wants to get um more information on this do they contact you direct contact us direct we've got um information well there's a flyer that you, you could uh, potentially post on on the the website if you want to jim i can send that to you but yeah but you have to get specific mortgage advice as well because there are only a small number of lenders are actually participating in the scheme and uh, the the lift scheme itself it's run by a comp housing company called link housing but yeah. under the scottish government rules they insist that you get independent financial advice mm -hmm. from a mortgage advisor um you would need to get the mortgage in principle first get an idea of affordability then you would apply to the lift scheme and yeah. they would then come back saying based on your available deposit and your income and what you can get on a mortgage this is the price threshold that you would be looking to buy at mm -hmm. and then you got a limited period of time where you can go out and find a property you would then have to go back to them with the property schedule and the home report because they they've got a veto on the on the build up quality of the property itself yeah. if they then come back saying yes that's an acceptable property you would make your offer be your solicitor as normal. And if you get accepted, it would then be a case of speak to your mortgage advisor again to finalise the mortgage details and progress everything through to, to the final stages. Does it take, sorry, Neil, I was just going to say, does it take longer for the whole process of buying a house if you're using the likes of the lift scheme or will it generally still take sort of around eight weeks or so to finally buy a house yeah that part of it shouldn't really be affected because any additional work's getting done up front sort of prior around about the sort of agreement and principal stage so you would get pre-approved for the lift scheme and your mortgage before you're actually starting to make an offer on the property um, obviously you also need to let your solicitor be aware of the fact that the gut there is going to be a government equity loan involved um, so they, they have additional legal work to do. So your fees might be a bit higher than the, they would normally be. I mean, personally, if I'm doing an application for someone for the lift scheme or help to buy as it used to be, we do have to charge a bit more because that is, is time and, um, and effort that we have to put to do that if, if the client wants us to help them out with it, but that's that's their choice. Um, yeah. And but yeah, time frames on completion should be much the same. The mm -hmm. um, question I've got is probably more uh, around the first home fund. You know, that's been a really good stepping stone for a lot of people um, over the last couple of years, you know, that we probably never have got on the housing ladder at all. Yeah. Um, if that comes back again, uh, my question was, um, if somebody lives with someone in a property and that their partner has a mortgage, but they want to buy a property together if one of the party has never had a mortgage does that make them eligible for the first home fund uh well the oh, bad news is one. that we've been told it's not coming back oh that's a shame so um that was top you basically confirmed when it when it ran out of money last year um which is what at that point they did increase start to increase the price thresholds for the lift scheme and try to open that up a bit more mm. so yeah, under that under that scheme, it was possible to for a non first time buyer to buy with a first time buyer and still apply for the scheme. My understanding of the list scheme, and I, there's not been any mention of changes in this, so I could get confirmation and we can post it. But my understanding it is strictly for first time buyers and then some other set groups. Um, so, in terms of what those groups are we would be talking about um so obviously first time buyers then you've got people in social housing or rent or council housing that are trying to buy their first property you've got people with a housing needs so potentially people with disabilities 
over 60s, yeah. ex-forces personnel, things like that. So it's not just first-time buyers, but mm -hmm. there's a, a limited group of, of other individuals that might qualify for it as well. And it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be young people that necessarily take take part in the scheme. Yeah. I thought Patrick Harvey would read all up for the first home fund, considering he's got enough to say about everything else. <laughs> from, I think it was just, probably just a political was, comment here. It was costing them too much money. So yeah, yeah. it was it was too popular. It probably uh, sounded its own death bell, really. Yeah, well, it was well, too popular. I mean, what, what? I mean, what? What do you think you would do? I mean, you're getting twenty five thousand pounds towards the price of buying your property, and mm -hmm. you don't need to pay any interest on it at all. <laughs> Exactly. And 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 basically, your only commitment is actually to pay back the proportionate amount of the property at that value, twenty five thousand pound represented, when you go on to sell the property. So if you never sell the property, technically you're never due it back, are you? Exactly, and that that is the same with the lift scheme. To be fair, as well, it's, it's there's no mm -hmm. monthly repayments, there's no interest. It's repaid on sale of property, whether that's because you move out or you're carried out in a wooden box. So. Um, so yeah, um, there's no no obligation there. But like you say, Jim, it was it was incredibly proper. I remember we did a video the first, when it was originally launched. And, yeah. uh, I think I said to you at the time, my colleague and, and Ian and I, when we first got the information through, we basically both thought this was the first, the best first time buyer scheme we'd ever seen in yeah. a combined what thirty years in the industry. So mm. yeah, it was it was incredibly popular. And, too popular for them to afford to keep it going, unfortunately. So just think, is, is, the, is the lift scheme the only thing available to people right now then? Is that all that's really available? Unfortunately, yeah. There's a small amount of help to buy on the small builder help to buy. Yeah. Um, so your mainstream builders, Barrett's, Muir Homes, Miller Homes, you won't get it. But mm -hmm. um, smaller firms, for instance, I do a lot with DJ Lane in Dundee. Um, other smaller independent firms, you could potentially get it, but obviously uh, on that, it's only properties max price two hundred thousand. Yeah. What about? Oh, it was on the tip of my tongue. It'll come back to me. Oh, move on. Anyway, <laughs> let, let's talk about things like the affordability then. So, what's been happening in, in the market just now? I heard some rumor that they were relaxing some of the restrictions that they put on since the credit crunch. Um, and one of them was possibly the affordability test. What's happening with that, and what is that? Yeah, it's, they, they've referred to it as the affordability test, but to my mind, it's the stress testing behind the affordability test. Yeah. So, as I say, when I go to when I'm dealing with a client, especially a first time buyer, and I'm talking to them about how much a mortgage lender is willing to lend them, it, it's variable on a number of factors. Obviously, income and outgoing. But number of kids in the house, retirement age, how long you're doing the mortgage over, what debts you've got, also even the size of the deposit you're putting down can have an impact on the size of the mortgage that you were actually mm -hmm. entitled to. In the background of all of that, there's always been the concern that because interest rates have been at incredibly low levels since the credit crunch, and because prior to the credit crunch, people borrowed more money than they could realistically afford and interest rates shot up, the, the Bank of England put in a requirement that lenders, when assessing affordability, had not couldn't just look at what's affordable today while rates are low, but what would happen if their variable rate went after the two-year fixed rate finishes, if that rate jumped by, by 3% in the next sort of three to five years. Um, that 3% yeah. background calculation has been removed, but everything else is still in place. Well, I say it's been removed. The requirement to have it has been removed. It's actually up to the individual lenders whether they remove it from their calculations or not. But yeah. they will still assess overall affordability. They'll still look at income outgoings, the length of the mortgage. They'll um, also have the the maximum level that they can lend, what we call the, the LTI, the loan to income calculation in the background. Yeah. So... The average figure across the mortgage market is about 4.5%, usually 4.49 to be precise for most lenders. But mm -hmm. for instance, your biggest lender in the country, Halifax, NatWest, or up slash RBS, if you're only putting a 5 or 10% deposit, they will actually reduce that down to, I think it's about 4.25. Um, but then there are other lenders, and a few more have actually just come out this week and announced that for yeah. higher income earners, so 70K plus, 
you can potentially actually bore up to 5.5 times income. Okay. But your average customer is not going to have access to that. So four and a half or four, 4.49 tends to be the rule of thumb, but that's an absolute maximum. Do you think? Do you think this is a result as they realise that as they go higher in base rate levels, that the affordability test won't actually will actually pre, will actually exclude quite a lot of people? Then it would do, yeah, because if you you're basing it on the the rate that is going to be applied once the current deal runs out, and yeah. variable rates were already anywhere between sort of three point six nine to five percent. So if you add 3% to what was a 5% variable rate, you're looking at stress testing at a mortgage at 8%. Yeah, some variable rates now are about 6.09. Exactly. And they could go up further if there are more interest rates. So, yeah, it was becoming very heavy-handed. Well, but when you think about it, I mean, they are talking about interest rates or base rates going up to at least possibly it could touch 3%. Um, so if, if, if base rates touch 3%, we've got another 1.25 on there. So if you're at six just now, you're at seven, seven point two five, and you know what's going to happen. They're going to put it up to eight just to get an extra, because because <laughs> the the base rate goes up, but you usually you usually put it a wee bit more. Of that you know, I don't know if anybody else has noticed that. <laughs> your base rate goes up half a percent, but your mortgage goes up point seven five. Um, I've I'm I've not seen that recently because there have been a number of interest rates and usually when I see the lenders email about them adjusting the base rate, it has yeah. been in line with the, um, so the base rate. But in the past, they've put it, when rates were down and st low for a long period of time, they did actually increase their own variable rates, even though the Bank of England base rate never went yeah. up. Because like, so what you, you are correct about is the fact that it's not directly linked for most lenders, so they can put it up yeah. as much as they want and potentially not reduce it if when rates start to come back again, down again. Yeah. I'm just amazed they used the word bank and fair in the same sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is what I was going to ask you. Where what what's happening with 95% mortgages? Are they still available? The guarantee uh, you know um, the UK government put in place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean some lenders aren't even bothering with the guarantee. And it's okay. not it's not relevant from the application point of view. It's because so for people for people out there then for the ninety five percent mortgages, um, can we recap what it actually means? What what was put in place in the first place, and 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 then how will that affect people? And because there, there will be people out here for the first time making a decision to look at getting a mortgage, or possibly even remortgage, or possibly even even finance their house for the first time, um, yeah. because it's maybe they decide to release some equity, and uh, because of the current circumstances, they need it. So. It's mainly, well, certainly for 95% lending, it's predominantly for new borrowers, so people buying a property. Okay. Um, there was a, lenders were restricting what they would lend after lockdown. And it wasn't until the beginning of last year that we saw most of them open back up to 90% mortgages. Yep. And then the government basically launched a scheme where they would effectively underwrite any potential losses a bank or lender would suffer if they wrote a 95% mortgage and it fell over at the other end because it, mm -hmm. they had to repossess. So they would underwrite any potential losses, which gave the mortgage lenders the confidence to start offering 95% mortgages. Yes. It's not a government scheme that you have to apply for. As far as you and I are concerned, we just go to the lender, request 95% mortgage, and all their criteria is, is, is normal. Yeah. So, so the, they wouldn't. An applicant doesn't see any difference. Um, obviously, you're paying a slightly higher interest rate than you would do if you've got a ten percent or fifteen percent deposit. Yeah. In terms of buy to let lenders, um, you know, where where does that leave buy to let lenders? I mean, are, are we still quite comfortable in the buy to let lending uh, field? Yeah, we're still quite comfortable. Um, Seventy five percent is still across the board as I'm as I still a, see I still see eight to percent now and again. Yeah. Is that just an urban myth? Is that just like no. here we go eight percent? Oh sorry, you don't qualify. You'll have to get 70. <laughs> <laughs> well there are eight percent deals out there from a few lenders, not that many. Most of them still cap it at 75, but yeah you, there is quite a jump in the rates. Um the the bigger issue with buy to let lending is more behind the rental calculation. Mm-hmm because of the changes over the last few years in the tax rules when it comes to investment properties 
and also because of the way buy to let mortgages are stress tested the rental yield for the property is higher to justify the mortgage than it yeah. was four five six years ago a wee bird they said that they actually did away with the income criteria for a lot of lenders have some still have the requirement to be an owner owner occupier of your current property some still require you to have a minimum income but there are plenty of buy to lens out there that now that don't care if you own your current property and don't necessarily care that you, whether you have a mortgage uh, sorry uh, a minimum income requirement as long as the property is classed as self-supporting in other words the rental yield is high enough to justify the mortgage that you're asking we'll for. we're getting back to 125 percent mortgages next <laughs> No, <laughs> I'll definitely you, see, not you see where that's you see where that's going though. You see where that's going. That we slight adjustments and over a period of time they might end up compounding to the end result that we're you know we're talking about right now because because you know yourself the banks and the business are lending money. Um, if they don't lend money, they don't make money. That's the reality. Um, they're not in the business of just taking people's money and giving them interest on it. It's it's the lender to make money. Yeah, but the. I mean, the restrictions are in place on lenders now means that there were, we would never see 100%. I don't think it was obviously 100% mortgages, let alone 125. Yeah. Um, the, the, the FCA, formerly the FSA, that fell asleep on the job with Northern Rock, they've got their wrists seriously burnt with that. So they did yeah. that lesson. Mm -hmm. Andrea, have you got any questions? Well, yeah. Um, obviously, when I originally read about the, the relaxation of um, the stress testing, um, they said it would help people who are currently renting and unable to get mortgages. Um, and they're often renting, paying a rent well above what they would be paying in a mortgage, but they were still unable. Are they now going to be able to really get on the property ladder? I'm not really seeing much difference. Um, the main people that it will affect are people with short, short length mortgages. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if, if you're a young, youngish person, so. That's and, not us. <laughs> I mean, I, I, don't, I mean, it, basically anyone to 35, I'm just, I'm just 40, at a young age, that's all. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you're, if you're looking at relatively young person with one kid, no debts, no, you're still no probably me. looking at a maximum of four and a half times income based yeah. on what we were talking about earlier. Right. But unless, but if you're older and you need to shorten the length of the mortgage or you've got more kids and more car loans and stuff like that, that's when it will potentially make more of a difference. But for most people, it's not, it's not really going to change what the size of their mortgage is actually going to be. Yeah. So people with shorter mortgages, older people, I would think they'll probably see a bit more benefit than, than someone in their 30s that's yeah. running it. Uh, to talk to yeah. you about that, Andrea, you had mentioned uh, briefly on that, and that stimulated me to think of something else. It's like I saw recently somebody posted on social media the fact that they couldn't get a mortgage because they didn't take the the rental payments into account. And I, and I thought, well, that's no true because we've been asked several times before by lenders of they kept yeah. the rent up to date and have they paid it on time every single time as, as a part of track record. Is, does, does that still happen just now? Um, I'm, I couldn't, I've never actually done an application where, where that they've asked. You have to provide that documentation. Out. Yeah. I mean, for maybe an adverse credit lender for somebody that's maybe. Yeah. I think, I think what happens, Neil, it usually comes after you've put the application in and then they I'm then, sure. they then, then the bank actually approaches us direct and then says yeah. to us, have their mortgage payments been up to date and have they been on time every single time? Have they missed anything? And it's kind of another way of referencing for someone. So that's yeah, why yeah. I went back to this yeah, person yeah. and said to them clearly, well, that's not the case. I don't know where they got this information because we've had that exact situation where banks have actually approached us to say, is yeah, their mortgage, yeah. is, their, is their rent payments up to, up to date? And should we be concerned that they don't pay on time? And the, the answer to every single one of them was yes. The rent's always yeah. been on time, and these for, people have actually gone on to get a mortgage. From your, from what the way you're looking at it, yeah, that's correct. But I'm wondering if the person you're you're commenting to, they were maybe talking about affordability. 
And I, 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 I hear think, it. I think it's something well, to do with that. I think there's yeah. there's usually a bigger picture behind that open statement, and they've not actually picked up on the fact that it's probably affordability more than anything. Yeah. So because I get people say, "Oh, I can, I can afford a, a, my, my, my rent at seven hundred and fifty pounds a month, but yeah. they won't give me a mortgage at six fifty. Yeah. But that's because it's not meeting their affordability criteria. At the end of the day, if you apply, if you're paying somebody rent, you're not getting your your income and affordability checked in the same way. You're mm. getting your your track record and your reliability checked and reference yeah. and that kind of thing. But they're not applying four and a half times less Absolutely. your council tax bills, less your travel costs. Well, less if you're, if you're paying house. rent, you you don't have an outstanding debt of a hundred thousand pounds in a mortgage, exactly. whereas a mortgage you do. So you would obviously yeah. have to do a different criteria, more strict and stringent. Um, Let's talk about. Um, have you heard, heard anything about the hundred-year mortgages? No, no. Well, that's a, there's a, there's an answer for you straight away because I heard that in the news that they were talking about. Oh, uh, you know what? It's, it, it's it's Bojo. It's obviously mentioned that you mentioned it at some point in time that they're that they're, they're looking at the possibility of maybe a hundred-year mortgages, and I'm thinking, is that a good thing? And and, it, and believe it or not, I've been told it, it, or I've been informed that apparently it happens in Europe where people have 100-year mortgages and it's just, it's just generational debt it carries on the property because then obviously if they pass away, then the mortgage passes to the next person. And I'm kind of thinking that doesn't sound great in the fact that who would want to just pass their, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, bye. <laughs> and yeah. it's like, by the way, you can have my debt. <laughs> exactly. I and and I can't imagine the banks would be very keen on it because you, how can you credit check or check the son or daughter's affordability? With but and dad a hundred-year mortgage, mortgage, especially, and how could you forecast for that? Eh? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I could see how that would it would make sometimes things a lot simpler because I do know of someone who's um, his father, the last of his surviving parents, died, um, and he was left either to sell the house and as an only child, um, he wanted to go and live in the house but there was yeah. an outstanding mortgage on it and he ended up having to sell his own house which he would have done anyway but then he had to go through the process of applying to be able to buy his, his father's house yeah and it but, did take but, but not, quite a long time and he was anyway mm -hmm. I, I can't see how a hundred year mortgage could pass to someone else because the criteria would be completely different um yeah. and and when would you take out a hundred year mortgage you would take it you could only legally take it out from 18 years old so if you're 18 years old, um, who's going to live to 118? I mean, I know I am, but you are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about people like me that don't have kids? I, can't, I don't think my dog's going to take on the debt after I go. Yeah. So I know. I thought you were saying what what happens if you about people that don't have kids might live longer. Yeah. Oh, well, there's that, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Is that something no, you would like to <laughs> Less stress yeah. involved. <laughs> yeah. Uh, true enough. Um, what about, I, I mean, I've seen something recently on, on Facebook, you know, on social media about saving money. I mean, obviously, everybody wants to try and save some money because of their, their daily costs and everything are going up with fuel prices and that. But yeah. they were saying that there was a way that you can do it by actually paying a little bit more on your mortgage each month saves you thousands at the end uh, is there any truth in that and is it worth doing yes and yes um because what you're effectively doing is you're overpaying so um that means if you if you if you make pay an extra 100 pounds a month to your mortgage that's 100 pounds pure debt repayment capital. so your, your capital is reducing by an additional right. 100 pound a month so the next month when they apply the interest to the outstanding debt it's a smaller debt, therefore there's less interest. But the other thing is, if you pay the mortgage back, overpay that, that way, and let's say it was a 25 year mortgage, you overpay and it ends up being a 20 year mortgage because you've paid extra to it, that's five years fewer interest that yeah. you've actually, you're paying back. This was, well. the, this was the difference, Neil, when they <laughs> talked about the interest only mortgages and the capital repayment, didn't they? I mean, the overall total you actually pay in an interest only mortgage is actually more than what the capital repayment is. Exactly, yeah, because the debt's never reducing over time. Yeah, so you're paying uh, a, a, a bigger amount of interest involved in that. And yeah. and for people out there that want to do that, it is actually quite a good scheme. And and still, they, they, they should want to talk to you anyway, just to make sure they're actually doing the right thing, because 
because it's important to get the facts and make a decision based on facts rather than thinking, just make it on what you think it's going to be or what yeah. it is. Um, and that's why they need to talk to you. I have put your contact details, your email address, and your 0133 number in the, uh, co uh, the the comments here just now. So if anybody wants to get in touch with Neil, please feel free to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Have you got anything else to say, Neil, about mortgages or anything like that? Is there anything well, else we should talk about? Just going back to that point Andrew was talking about, and, and like that you said, getting the advice. The advice is important because while it might seem great now to, to either up your mortgage payment to pay it back faster, or whatever and, and have it short term it doesn't necessarily always fit your circumstances and there might be other ways of achieving the same result so yeah. especially if you're someone that does fairly seasonal work and so your income's higher during the summer than it is during the, win the winter or you're self-employed or just with the cost of living crisis and you're afraid what's going to happen in six months time what i what i do for sometimes say to people depending on the circumstances well no stick with a longer mortgage now because that means you've got a, a an agreed set minimum payment that you have to meet. That's at a lower yeah. level that you know you're going to be comfortable with. But then take advantage of the overpayment option and just pay a chunk every so often as and when you can, rather than taking a shorter mortgage and having a much higher committed monthly payment. Yeah, that's that's like cash flow is king, isn't it? Exactly. Um, yeah. Because yeah. because the cash is better in your pocket to use when you need it, rather than actually having to commit to having to do all the time, like exactly what you said. Um, the, my advice as well, possibly for someone like that, and just just a just my opinion more than anything, is you're better to actually put it aside into an ISA or something. Um, and I know the ISA doesn't uh, potentially make as much money as what the interest rate you're paying on the mortgage, but at least you've got that money aside as a buffer in case anything does happen. And it's like what you say, Neil. It's it, you could you could pay down chunks at the end of each years and stuff like that. I think it's usually typically up to ten percent before you get any penalties, eh? Yeah, ten percent a year normally, start based on the start of your mortgage balance. There yeah. are some lenders that will actually allow you to increase your direct debit. So mm -hmm. during a period of time where you might have a higher income for the next four or five months, because you're work, working longer during the summer, you can increase your direct debit by an extra hundred pound a month, but mm -hmm. then. So we come into winter, you could then reduce it back down to the, the set minimum uh, monthly payment. Um, so you're, you're no longer overpaying, but um, you're still and, getting that benefit. And a lot of people actually don't think that's a huge amount. I mean, if you're paying another £100 a month, but if you pay another £100 a month for six years, uh, for six months, then you are talking about another £600. Um, so that's actually reducing the interest by the £600 as well. But if you compound that over the life of the mortgage, say a 20-year mortgage, you're talking about uh, another twelve thousand pound. You are, and you're also the interest associated with. You're also building in more equity to the property more quickly. So if you do come to sell in three or four years, yeah, the amount of money you're going to have or profit you're going to have be taking out the property for your it's next better springboard for the next property, isn't it? Yeah, it's a better springboard for the next property. Plus the fact uh, it allows you more choices later on. Plus the fact is if prices go up. Um, and your loan to value goes down um, when you come to remortgage because you're coming out a fixed rate deal, uh, then you're probably in a better position to get a better rate in comparison to what you had before. Subject to rates not going up like they are at the moment, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I heard that in the last the last year in 2021, about 90% of people went on fixed rate mortgages. And overall, there's probably around about 79% of people on fixed rate mortgages right now. Um, which is a sigh of relief if that's the case, because then if there's any impact on interest rates going up, it doesn't impact too many people all at one time. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, people that are coming off their fixed rates from before now, we've yeah. seen a big difference between what we're, they're going on to compared to where we were a year ago. Um, but yeah, it is, it is obviously insulating them against any further increases over the next next few years. Yeah. And a lot of people are going for five-year rates at the moment as well, which... What is the five-year rate just now, just out of curiosity? Do you know? Well, it will depend on, obviously, the, the overall loan-to-value, but yeah. in general terms, it's as cheap and in some cases cheaper than it's two-year fixed, which... Right, okay. And oh, that's, do, you think that's I, do you think that's because they're steering them towards that, um, to have some certainty? Well, it, they, they actually... That gap narrowed last year when rates were still low. Yeah. Um, so I think it was just became quite popular last year uh, lenders were offering them 
and it's kind of stayed that way because traditionally you do the longer you fix for the higher the interest rate is so mm -hmm. in 18 and a half years of me doing this job this is the first time i've ever really seen five-year rates that are cheaper the other way than two yeah. yeah i was quite surprised about that as well when i saw it um and then that's when i thought why would they want to do that but then it might give them some sort of um it might give them some sort of certainty because the i don't know what they do i think i've got a funny feeling to buy the money from the money market at that rate over that five years period therefore yeah. they're fixed into that as well so it, it makes their liquidity uh, kind of certain for the next five years if everybody fixes at five-year rates um and they've got some sort of certainty and planning they could also be speculating as well that rates are going to come back down again they've got all these customers tied into five-year mm -hmm. deals that they're actually paying higher rates on i would find i would i would find that hard to believe considering the pundits are talking about inflation now well the bank of england's talking about inflation could reach 13 percent, and then some of the think tanks are actually talking about 18 percent. hopefully that's a relatively short term issue if because if it's not then we're all in big trouble yeah i i well that there's there's a combination of events isn't there there's things like yeah. the ukraine war that's affecting that there's obviously brexit's affecting that with the import export duties and stuff like that and um, so that's obviously putting a lot more pressure on prices as, as they increase um, and the bureaucratic process of getting everything in and out of the country and into other countries as well so these are factors outside our control and how long how long that goes on you're absolutely right it's uh, hopefully it's just a short-term thing uh, yeah. and and it, and it should alleviate over time I think that's what people talked about property prices anyway, and the fact that you know we kind of keep going on at record at fourteen and fifteen percent, you know, hikes every single year, um, and lo and behold, it's now coming down to a more stable rate just now in terms of the rate. So it does have that effect where the the curve uh, goes up and then it then it comes back down to stabilise uh, overall. Yeah. But I don't see actually any negative growth month to month in the actual property market right now. So that then still suggests to me that. There will be no huge drops. It will be a it will be a smoothing off, uh, more than likely for anything in terms of the in terms of the amount over the um, over the uh, actual valuation of, over the twelve month period from the year before uh, uh, we're actually achieving now. Um, I think Fife something like twelve percent average price in Fife is round about one hundred sixty seven thousand for a property. Still more affordable. When you look at London at five hundred five thousand for the average price, and you think. Hundred and sixty-seven thousand pound in five, yeah. Uh, and then, then you look at things like, and, and somebody questioned me on this, and I, and I was quite surprised about this as well, with the average salary, in five almost being the same as the Scotland and same as the rest of the UK, um. So uh, the multiplier is something like five point five times to buy the average house in five, whereas the in Scotland it's it's round about six and a half to seven, and in the rest of the UK it's possibly around about eight or nine times. Right? So mm. there's not, and yet when that was happening at the credit crunch, the eight or nine times, because that's where we got to at that point in time, um, the, 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 average, uh, the average interest rate was around about 7%. But the average interest rate now is almost around about, what, two and a half. No, I mean we're we're higher than that now. We're we're definitely above between three and four for most of the deals that I'm seeing at the yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, but even still, historically speaking, like you say, that is still actually fairly low. Yeah, and then then when you think about it and factor into the fact that salaries have risen over these years and over that time as well, disposable income is a lot higher in comparison to what it was then. I still think we've got. A, 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 I still think we're in a in a good position. Um, Unemployment still sitting at a good rate. You've got 1.1 million people chasing 1.3 million jobs and employment employment figures. So I, I, do, I do think personally we'll, we'll weather the storm, but yeah. how bad that storm is going to be, only time will tell over the next six months to a year. Yeah, and the, and and like you say, the, the thing I keep saying to people is with interest rate rises, the, there's a limit to how much they're going to benefit an inflation rate because of the causes of inflation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so no. let's wrap up here. Have you got something oh, to say, sorry. Andrea? Yeah, yeah, I did have another, just another couple of things. Go on, and we're talking just beforehand. Um, so help to buy ISAs. Um, a very good idea. Uh, oh, good helps guys. you save uh, for your impending purchase. Now, when you're using a help to buy ISA, and I've got uh, family experience of this recently, um, there is a government um bonus 
that goes with that. However, we found out too late uh, that it has to be applied for before the property sale is completed. Um, now, Neil has assured me that the mortgage advisor isn't the person to be dealing with this, um, but it should be your solicitor. So you need to make sure that you have told your solicitor you are using a, a help to buy ISA for your purchase and that they will need to apply for your bonus for you in plenty of time. Um, so that's my hint to help people <laughs> hopefully not lose out nearly £1,800 like my family member did. Um, but Neil, have you got any other do's and don'ts if you're applying for a mortgage? So I think some of these are quite important not to do. Yeah, um, don't go and buy an expensive car just before you want to buy a house, yeah. um, unless you're paying cash. So, yeah, uh, I mean, obviously, one thing we say to first time buyers that might not have much of a credit history, taking on credit and managing it well is a good thing to do because it helps build up your score. But if you're going to be applying well for a mortgage probably within the next six months, then it'll probably do more harm than good because it'll actually impact your score negatively initially. Um, I'd say don't take on any big debts and not even just until you're applying for the mortgage, but until you've actually completed on the mortgage, because lenders will still run credit checks up until the point they release funds. And even though you've got a mortgage offer, if you go and then take out car finance the week before you buy the house, that's going to affect your affordability and you could have your mortgage offer withdrawn when you actually try and complete on the purchase. Um, getting whole of market advice is key. Lenders, there's a whole heap of reasons why you shouldn't just go to your own bank. Lack of choice is one. Lack of service is another. They don't guide you through the housing price, uh, process in general. They don't phone up five properties and make offers on houses for you like I've been known to do for clients of ours in the past. Yeah. Um, you don't get decent protection advice for looking after your family or your, your income. And you don't really get advice on what's going to be the most suitable lender for your needs because everyone's needs are different. Not every lender is going to be suitable for somebody's situation. You're talking about time frames. Some lenders at the moment are particularly slow because, as Jim said, a lot of people are applying for fixed rate mortgages these days that haven't bothered in the past. And time frame for mortgage lenders assessing applications has seriously reduced. Um, so it's, uh, well, sorry, it's, it's lengthened, I should mm -hmm. say. The service levels have reduced. So for a lot of lenders, it's taken a lot longer to get even an initial assessment on an application, let alone actually getting a mortgage offer. So yeah. advice is key. Um, and uh, basically get your documents to your mortgage advisor, whether it's me or somebody else, as quick as you can. Because as I say, lenders are removing rates with little or no notice. And I've quoted a client a rate on the phone or on a video call at seven o'clock at night. I've gone back the next day to submit their application and it's gone. So yeah. the longer you wait, the higher the interest rate you're going to be paying at the moment. There's no doubt about it. When we talk about the help to buy ISAs, I mean, I've put I've put information in there from the UK government about help to buy ISA. I mean, it is no longer available, but it still gives people information about it are still currently in the system with the help to buy ISA. It, is something replaced the help to buy ISA? Is there something, is it a lifetime sort of thing? Yeah, it's called a lifetime ISA now, similar yeah. idea, um, but it's only open to uh, at certain age brackets. Uh, yeah. So young, younger people that can apply for the lifetime ISA, but similar idea, the government would put in, I think it's a 25% bonus um, after you've reached a certain limit of a minimum deposit yourself. And as long as the, the funds and the, the bonus are being used for part of the deposit for the property, then the government would chip in and increase the, increase the amount that you get back from it. Yeah, I'm going to put in uh, details of Money Saving Expert. They've got uh, top lifetime ISAs. They're called LISAs. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to put that in the comments as well for people, that the lifetime ISAs. And Money Saving Expert will probably give you more information on that. But again, as I said, if you're needing uh, any information for mortgages or stuff like that and what you would do with that eventually, because clearly that's obviously designed to go alongside as a deposit while you're actually getting a mortgage at the same time. So exactly. then you'd come to you as well um, for that process. Uh, I, and I think we've kind of covered everything. Mm -hmm. everything. I, I'm going to say absurdly at the last minute, um, um, uh, 
mortgages for people on benefits? Difficult, but if it purely benefits. Because I've then, heard them mentioned by Boris Johnson. <laughs> yeah. Um, got one lender that will definitely consider it. Most really? of them wow. will probably want some level of earned income as well. Yeah, but that that's that's quite surprising, isn't it? Because um, because I'll, I'll dare I say that that's how they got the subprime problem in America, where people was were on basically welfare and they were just signing them up on mortgages and giving them a mortgage for their house. I mean, they they do want obviously evidence of it. So uh, depending yeah. on the type of credit, that you, uh, sorry, benefits that you're on, if it's mm-hmm. the old fashioned working tax or child tax credit, they want to see the annual award letter. If yeah. it's um, Union, so it's uh, no, it's no as if you're on job seekers allowance or anything like that, and yeah, it's like I know for, for get long, long-term benefits that are guaranteed. Yeah. Um, so, you, so universal credit, then, but, but not the housing benefit element of that. Yeah. So, if you if you receive six hundred pound a month universal credit, but four hundred pound of that is housing benefit, that's only available for rent. So, we would have to deduct that, and you would use the, the two hundred pound net figure. Mm-hmm. Um, but so for, for universal credit, working tax credits, that kind of thing, personal independence payments or what we call disability living allowance, these things are long term, generally guaranteed. Lenders yeah. will take them into account. Not every, most lenders would want an earned in element as well. So some sort of earned income. It wouldn't make any sense, would it, Neil, to have someone uh, taking out a mortgage on uh, some sort of benefit if if they're actually getting housing benefit, because the very fact that they're getting housing benefit means they can't afford the, they can't afford it well, in the first place. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, well, they have to, have to so that would preclude the fact that you know uh, they would be able to afford a mortgage. Um, yeah. So and, and so if you're not got any housing benefit element in there, and it is like what you say, a guaranteed long term benefit, then yeah, I could see the point of that. Um, how that would how that would be how that would be, make sense to a degree. Yeah, and uh, most lenders will only take a percentage of it into account as well. All right, okay. So a lot of them might only take 50, 60% of that benefit income to add to your overfall, overall affordability. Um, as I say, there is one lender that would potentially do 100% benefits, depending on what they are, and take 100% of the amount, less the housing benefit that we just talked about. Yeah, excellent. Thanks very much for coming on the show. And I hope Thank everybody you. got more, more information about this in, the, in, in terms of mortgages and the current market and what we're doing. As I said again in the comments, Neil's contact details are in there. You can speak to him direct. If you do have a comment to make, please feel free or a question to ask. You can message us, you can say a comment in here, you can hit that like button as well, you can send it to someone else, you can tag someone else in. Remember, this is great advice for anybody out there thinking about buying their house or they're thinking about reviewing their mortgage position, or they're just thinking about doing anything in general around the mortgage market, uh, tag them in it or share it with them, uh, even privately. Uh, just It gives them a bigger insight uh, to get the facts. And I always keep saying, do not make your decisions on opinions, because um, even idiots have opinions. Everybody has them, but idiots have them as well. So make it on, make it on, on the fact by a professional person, and that is Neil Bird, who talks about mortgages. Every single time people start talking about mortgages, I immediately go, I know somebody that knows about that. I don't need to talk about that, because I know nothing about that, really. Uh, there's the expert. I'll tell you the current position of the market. It's Neil Bird. Uh, and that's it, Neil. Thanks for coming on the show, as I said. Uh, thanks for coming to you, Andrea. Um, ask Thank these you. questions, and, uh, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye for now. Thanks both.